Welcome to the Author's Cut series. Uh, this is a webinar where we unpack several chapters of the O'Reilly book, Observability Engineering, uh, all at once. And so you should think of this series like one part book club, um, one part cutting room floor, right? And, and usually what it means is uh, we'll talk about the content, uh, we'll summarize some of the things that are in the book, and then we'll usually give you takes that uh, we couldn't squeeze into the book uh, for, for whatever reason. Uh, and usually what we do is we take some time to see how these concepts that are in, in the O'Reilly book are implemented using real world examples. So today's session, uh, Options for Managing Telemetry Volume at Scale, uh, means that we'll be covering chapters 17 and 18, sort of. Um, and so uh, chapter 17 is cheap and accurate enough, our, sam our, our uh, chapter on sampling. Uh, and chapter 18 uh, was contributed by our guests today, uh, Ryan and Suman, and that is Telemetry Management with Pipelines. Uh, but first, before we do any of that, uh, we are going to go ahead and uh, recap some of the things that we talked about. But first, even before that, uh, if I can make my slides go, I'm having the hardest time with slides today for some reason. Um, uh, we'll do some introduction. So uh, unfortunately, Charity could not uh, join us today. She had a last minute conflict. But hi, I'm George Miranda, uh, one of the co-authors of our book and today's webinar host. Uh, you can find me uh, on Twitter at gmiranda23. Uh, Liz, why don't you go next? Hi, I'm Liz. I'm a principal developer advocate at Honeycomb, and I'm also one of the book co-authors. Um, and I've been at Honeycomb three and a half years. Awesome. Boop. Thank you. And like I mentioned, today we have uh, two, two special guests uh, that are, are uh, contributing authors for Chapter 18, Ryan and Suman. Ryan, why don't you start us off? Hey everyone, my name is Ryan. Um, I'm a director of engineering at Slack. I've been at Slack for about three years, and I'm really happy to be here. And um, I'm going to hand it off to you, Stumad. Hi, everyone. My name is Suman uh, Karamuri. I'm a senior staff software engineer at Slack. Uh, I've been here for four years. Uh, glad to be here. Cool. Well, we have a, a, a full panel of guests, and we have a lot of content to get through. Um, so let's go ahead and jump right in. Um, if you're joining us for the first time, uh, let's kind of bring you up to speed and give you a little bit of context in terms of things that have been happening. So we started this series with a look at structured events uh, and how they are the fundamental building block for observability. Uh, in our previous session, we've looked at various telemetry types, how to get started with open telemetry and how logs compared to traces and metrics. Um, spoiler, they can all be derived from structured events. Um, I suppose that's not much of a spoiler, right, since we've covered that at length in the past few episodes. Um, but we also spent some time looking at uh, how you analyze uh, those arbitrarily wide structured events, right? How do you find answers in the sea of telemetry data that you are going to collect about your applications? Uh, we covered the core analysis loop, right, which is basically a, a data-driven way of combing through various events to look for patterns so that you can very quickly zero in on where issues may be happening anywhere inside of your applications or in your systems. Um, and so, right, using the core analysis loop, you can more effectively resolve incidents, improve performance, and generally reap the benefits of, of this thing that we call observability. And so that's that's been like most of the first half of this series, right, which is sort of the basics of observability. What are the building blocks? What are the actions? What are some of the outcomes that you need? Um, and in our very last episode of this session, uh, or this series rather, uh, we transitioned to looking at use cases uh, that are adjacent to managing your applications in production. And so in our last episode, we were joined by Frank Chen, uh, also from Slack and contributing author for chapter 14. Uh, where we looked at observability for your CI CD pipelines. And we looked at ways that you can generate traces um, and, and basically collect telemetry about what is happening as you deploy your applications to production. And so uh, I think that was a very fun, action packed uh, session. I very highly recommend uh, watching that one uh, if you haven't. Uh, I think it's very complementary to today's episode. Uh, where we're joined by uh, Ryan and Suman to, to look at uh, the rest of our contributed chapters. 
And what I like about the way that this series is evolving is that today we are transitioning sort of from observability basics and observability use cases. And we are moving into looking at uh, things that become a little more relevant when you are practicing observability at scale. So typically, right, there's very little overhead uh, involved when it comes to capturing those structured wide events uh, from every user request in your system uh, and you know, sending them to an observability back end. But when you are operating at scale, that, that minimal trickle of observability data can very quickly turn into a torrential flood. Um, and when that happens, there are additional considerations um, for how observability is practiced. And so what I want to know before we go into today's content is that uh, although the things that we are discussing today uh, become uh, definitely become a necessity at scale, um, sampling and telemetry management uh, via pipelines are helpful at any scale, um, even at smaller scales, right? And so when we think of sampling, really, you know, typically it's you know thinking about the fact that maybe you receive 10 billion events per day right, in terms of what's happening in your application and the amount of telemetry that you're collecting. Do you really need to keep the 8 billion events that just said status okay, right? Or, or do you just need to have a representative sample of those to know how many of those you got and when? However, right, similarly at smaller scale, if you only receive 100,000 events, right, do you really need to keep those 90,000 events that said 200 status okay? Uh, maybe, maybe not, right? However, at smaller scale, that choice isn't really costly, right? Is it, it, isn't, it isn't costly enough to be considered super critical. And so the, the practices that we're describing today may not be obligatory at smaller scale. Um, you know, you, you don't have to do these things because the extenuating circumstances of your application and the, and the traffic you receive don't require them. But nonetheless, um, these practices are useful and they have benefits and benefits that we're going to go into today, um, even if they're not absolutely required, right? And absolutely necessary. Also, uh, I'm so going that, to mention yes, uh, go Honeycomb's free tier is 20 million events per month. So right. if for some reason you're, you know, at 19, 20, 21, and you're like, oh goodness, I need to squeeze to fit in, sampling might be able to help you. Who knows? Yeah, it's true, right? And so Let's, let's go ahead and dive into a little bit about chapter 17. And before we dive into this, I wanna say that um, uh, we got together with Ryan and Suman and we looked at some of the things that we wanted to cover uh, in today's session. And we realized that both chapter 17 and chapter 18 are, are meaty enough topics that um, even though in the author's cut series, we typically do multiple topics at the same time, in this case, we might even consider breaking up the two. So I'll tell you what we're gonna do. We're gonna talk a little bit about sampling. And I think the thing with the sampling chapter is that there is a lot of meaty context. It's a very um, code heavy chapter that gets into the internals of different sampling strategies and it gets really into the weeds, um, which is great. I highly recommend that chapter if you are interested in the internals of how sampling works. But I think we're gonna talk about sampling at a high level. We're gonna take any of your questions around sampling, especially if you joined uh, today just to learn a lot more about sampling. Great, we can talk about those things real time or we can save it towards Q&A. We're gonna talk about it a little bit and, and spend a little bit of time here, but I think the, the meat of what we're gonna do um, is around uh, looking at telemetry pipelines and how they can help. So with that, Liz, you had some thoughts around sampling. Uh, what do you what do you want to add to that, or how do you want to start this conversation? Yeah. So let's very quickly kind of level set on why we do sampling. Um, some of the stra various strategies you may hear about, um, but as George said, we're not going to go into the weeds of how this is actually implemented. That chapter is mostly a show or work chapter rather than a you know you must understand every nitty gritty detail in order to do this. Um, it turns out there are common shared libraries and binaries that we provide you to do this. So why sampling? As George mentioned, if you are receiving a large quantity of events and a majority of them are successful, you probably don't need to keep all of the successful events because observability is about speed and balancing cost rather than necessarily being 100% correct uh, and taking forever to run. Ideally, you should not be using observability for your billing pipeline uh, to, to bill people. You can have observability about your billing pipeline, but like you get the drift. 
So when we talk about um, trying to sample away redundant events, we're not talking about decreasing your ability to debug um, things that are happening at the tails, things that are going wrong. What we're talking about is being economical and efficient with your computing resources. So how do we handle dealing with these kind of duplicate events? There's a couple of strategies that we go into in the book, one of which is basically to kind of introduce the idea that you can do sampling at all, right? That um, you can say, I'm going to just, you know, roll a uh, roll 2d10. Uh, if they both turn up as zero, then we know that uh, then we know that that's an event that we're keeping. So that's a one in a hundred uh, sampling rate. So that allows you to, on the back end, reconstruct what happened by saying, OK, if the sample rate was 1 for 100, then it means every event that I received represented 100 events like it. So if we're asking questions like, how many events were there, we'll multiply it out by 100. So, so great so far. But it turns out that kind of static head sampling, right, where the rate is the same, and also you're doing the decision at the very beginning, it's very inflexible and it causes you to miss out on a lot of that detail at the edges. Because if you have a rare event that happens one in a thousand times and you're sampling your traffic one for a hundred, the chances of you being able to catch it in the act are one in a hundred thousand, which is not wonderful. So in order to deal with this, we employ two different strategies. The first strategy is that we say, okay, I'm going to have variable sample rates. So for instance, I might choose to sample some of my traffic one for one and some of my traffic one for 100. So kind of keeping a higher proportion of the more interesting traffic, knowing that at the end of the day, when Honeycomb or some similar system computes the results, we can weight the ones that were sampled away and restore that kind of missing data. So if we have five events that were sampled one for one, if we have two events that were sampled one for 100, then I know that there were 205 total events that I saw during that time period, even if I only saw seven actual events come through to Honeycomb. The second strategy is a little bit more interesting, right? The idea that we can, in addition to varying the sample rate, that we can also make sampling decisions based off of the actual result of the operation. So normally, when you're trying to perform tracing activity, you have to make the decision at the start of the trace, am I going to trace this through or not? Which works great when you're trying to conserve CPU resources of the process that's being traced, but does not necessarily achieve the results that you want if you're looking for some condition that you only know at the end of the trace, that you essentially have to trace everything. And then you have to decide, okay, what data am I throwing away versus what am I sending on to Honeycomb? So this is where tail sampling comes in. The idea that we can buffer all of the data as it comes in from all these systems, and we can wait until the entire trace has finished and then look to see, okay, was it a slow request? If so, send it on directly. Was it an error ring request? Again, send it one for one. Or was it one of the you know tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions of requests that were successful and fast, in which case keep one for 100, one for a thousand of them. So. Fortunately, the uh, ecosystem and set of tools for doing both uh, variable rate head sampling, uh, tail sampling, and also kind of the combination of those two, variable rate tail sampling, um, it has become a lot more robust. We've certainly shown our work both with the book and also with the Honeycomb Refinery uh, open source software. And that's kind of how we think about how do you manage this challenge of duplicate data in order to keep tracing economical. So I can genuinely say that like, part of why people were hesitant to trace at Google where I worked before Honeycomb was kind of the idea that, oh, it's too costly, or, oh, we have to do you know, sampling one for 100,000 because we're Google, and therefore like metrics are our only or primary tool. And it turns out that's really a false dichotomy. You can get both scale and tracing by sampling smartly. And I think that that kind of ties into what we're going to talk about next in terms of how do you configure the telemetry pipeline to ingest all this data and make the smart decisions and pass it on to the appropriate backends. Yeah, you know, Liz, I think the thing that I want to add to that is um, uh, when folks are first getting familiarized with sampling, I think the concern that I that I often hear is 
I'm, uh, how do I know what the right thing is to get, right? I'm probably going to miss data that, that I really want. And I think you did a really great job of covering different, uh, different methods for being able to just, you know, look at and keep, you know, the events that you care about versus the ones that you don't. And typically what you care about are those abnormal conditions, right? Those failures or those particularly slow requests. And I think the thing that I like about um, uh, how you can get started with refinery, for example, even is, uh, you know, ability to sort of, you know, run in uh, like a test mode, right? And be able to see which events would have been kept versus, you know, would have been dropped, um, but still keeping everything, right? And so there are ways to sort of ease into sampling. And I think, you know, you, you mentioned you, or you referred to the sampling chapter in the book as a show your work um, chapter. And I, I think it is, right? I think we really walk you through the internals of how those, those sampling mechanisms work. Um, but I, I think it's also a little bit reassuring and informative, right? Because if you understand how those methods work and what they are designed to do, you can figure out like, what is the right approach to figure out, right? Which events do I care about? Which are, you know, as, as you mentioned, right? Maybe extraneous successful events that I can just have a representative example for. Right, but you and, kind of show your work bit is very much of the, okay, I now conceptually yeah. understand why this is safe to do, why we can reconstruct the data afterwards. Yeah, for sure, right? And so with that, uh, I'm going to recommend folks, if you want to uh, uh, learn a little bit more about sampling, the O'Reilly chapter, I think is, is really great and informative for that. Liz also mentioned Refinery, um, which is honeycomb sampling solution, uh, which is also open source, right? So you can see how we apply that logic. You can run a Refinery instance of your own uh, and uh, let us know what you think. So also, uh, if you have questions about sampling, please throw them into the chat and would love to address those uh, as we go through today's content. Um, but- Yeah, I can make yeah. Wild's question very quickly. Um, oh, sure. Uh, Wild that. asks, how many, uh, if you've implemented distributed tracing using random sampling, uh, what are your thoughts on that? So that is essentially what I described earlier with the kind of naive head sampling, where you're just at the start of every request, uh, determining, you know, probability one in a hundred to pass it on uh, to the tracing backend, uh, probability 99 out of a hundred to do nothing, to not trace the request. Um, so yeah, basically the enhancements to that that we really, really recommend people do are in addition to doing the random sampling to cut the volume to at least pass along what the sample rate was. So we can, you know, instead of lying to you and saying there were a thousand requests when there were actually a hundred thousand requests to actually uh, give us that sample rate. And then after that, to start doing the more advanced techniques of variable sample rate, tail sampling. But head sampling probabilistically is fine. It's just, a very coarse tool that is going to destroy a lot of your kind of data at the tails uh, and make it harder to reconstruct. With that, uh, I think what I'd like to do is go ahead and um, focus a little bit more on telemetry management and pipelines. And so uh, Ryan, Suman, thank you so much for joining us today. And I think Ryan, you're, you wanted to kick off this discussion. Yeah, um, I just want to start up a little bit of background about telemetry pipelines. Um, this journey started about four years ago. We had a lot of events that needed to get to third places, and we had a very rudimentary pipeline for ancestral locks, and um, we found that was not reliable at all. So um, we created in house agent that actually then structural locks and ancestral locks through Kafka to uh, get the consumer this thing. And uh, we realized the power of this pipeline because the uh, Slack of customer things, if we care about customer health and customer events, which means that we're going to have to collect a lot of events. So we wanted to actually understand what's happened with the customer. And uh, Stumon created a, um, a event structure called the Span event. And the Span event is just a, um, a very wide, thin event. Um, and we actually used it to I understand what the customer is doing through our distributed system. And the interesting thing is that we created this pipeline even before Honeycomb came into the picture. And because of this pipeline, it was really easy to start sending all of the events to Honeycomb. We uh, created a consumer that actually should take all the events, translate them, and just send them off to Honeycomb. And um, you know, this pipeline um, has been growing. I think we're at about 
five trillion events per month through the pipeline, and about five hundred billion of those go go to honeycomb. There's so uh, there's a lot of customer data out there. We have a lot of customer data, and um, we actually have a really good operational picture of what the Slack customer is doing today. And we understand if they they have any problems with the client, if they're not able to reach the server, if uh, the Slack client is slow for any particular reason. And um, I hope that was a um, comprehensive enough introduction. Um, Stumon here will go into some of the details about the paper and yeah, I'd like to hand it off to you, Stumon here. Before we uh, go to Suman, can I ask a quick question? So sure. you created this pipeline before you were a Honeycomb client, right? Like this was kind of a generic telemetry management pipeline that you were able to configure to send data to Honeycomb. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, cool. it, um, and it's very much generic. Um, we created it because we need a, a simple way to emit logs and events from a Slack range, and we need to do it in a way that was that would lend to easy adoption because we have a lot of engineers to Slack and we can't do fake graphs differently to each one of them. And we provided them with a, um, a very open endpoint and it provided them with the standard libraries and they were able to easily implement all of these services. And um, cool. we um, were able to integrate them really robust adoption, especially with Honeycomb came into the picture. Oh, hey, thanks, Ryan. Uh, so hi, everyone. My name is Suman. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about like the telemetry pipeline we built here at Slack. So as Ryan pointed out, uh, a telemetry pipeline is uh, a piece of software that basically takes the telemetry data that your applications generate, whether it's logs or traces, and ingest them into a telemetry backend, right? Typically, uh, people would just set up uh, Prometheus to just scrape the server it's running. Uh, people would just set up Prometheus and Prometheus would scrape the server or they would just have a log search application, typically log the uh, log your logs to Elastic Backend or we have traces or events that we send to Honeycomb, right? Uh, so why do we need a telemetry pipeline uh, when the simple setup is so straightforward, right? So let's jump into that. Can I get the next slide, please? Yeah, so uh, there are multiple users of the telemetry pipeline. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about like roughly four, right? Uh, the first one is routing. Uh, so we have a lot of applications and a lot of applications data need to go to different places. For example, we take our logs and events and we route them to several backends like our Elasticsearch clusters, our data warehouse or Honeycomb. Right, and not all data is sent to all the places and only some parts of the data need to be sent to some, uh, some places. So a tele one of the big jobs of our telemetry pipeline is actually to route this data uh, from various uh, applications to their respective backend. Sometimes the same data, as Ryan said, is also sent to multiple backends. Um, the second use case uh, for telemetry pipelines is generally security and compliance. Uh, we have, uh, we take customer uh, privacy very seriously and data privacy very seriously here at Slack. So, uh, and we have, we have a lot, few, lot of laws and regulations to follow related to security and compliance around where the customer data lives, how it is handled, how long it stays, uh, who has access to it, et cetera, et cetera. And to meet all of these needs, uh, the telemetry management pipeline also sends uh, the data to respective backends, and those backends uh, actually ensure the data retention policies and who has access to them and things like that. The telemetry pipeline is also used to route the data from various geographic locations to a central location or uh, to just route the data within the uh, within the edge regions to keep the data within the edge regions to their respective backends and so on. Uh, the other big use of uh, the capacity management pipeline, as Ryan alluded to, uh, is uh, for capacity management. For example, not all of our backends are equipped to take, consume all the data uh, that we produce. Uh, as Ryan alluded, uh, we have about 5 trillion messages that we produce and we send like a subset of them to Uh Similarly, a lot of our, but we keep all of that data 
in our data warehouse on S3. And we also keep a lot of that data in our, uh, to, we also keep some of that data in an Elasticsearch cluster for dashboards and alerting. So uh, as a result, capacity management becomes a challenge and this is where the telemetry pipeline can help you. Uh, we, as the data comes in, we also filter the data for PII, uh, for any security uh, in token leaks and things like that. And also we also augment our data with additional metadata uh, so that uh, when the data is being consumed, it's easy for our users to use it. Uh, telemetry pipeline is a good place to do such data filtering and data augmentation. And also as Liz, Liz pointed out before, uh, sampling and things like that are also uh, the right, uh, telemetry pipeline is also the right place to do sampling and uh, uh, sampling and rate limiting. Uh, so we actually use uh, head-based sampling in our code to sample the traces, but we also do tail mail sampling in refinery to uh, sample how much data we send to Honeycomb. Hey, Suman, I know that you're, you're mostly gonna cover just those four, but I'm curious before we transition away from this slide, can you give us an example of like the kind of data transformation that might happen in a pipeline? Uh, sure. Uh, so the kind of data transformations are typically uh, around, uh, so if you have uh, multiple backends you are sending the data to, or if you have multiple instrumentation formats, for example, our traces, uh, some applications use Jaeger, some applications use Zipkin, and these applications are written before Otel existed. So uh, we have to support their custom formats. And instead of... Uh, uh, changing it in the application, which is harder to do, we actually change those, uh, do those transformations in our pipeline. Cool, that's a great example. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so the simplest of the telemetry pipeline actually has three components. It has a receiver, which actually accepts the data from the application reporting any telemetry. It can, it can be, you can push the data to it or it can pull the data. Uh, typically, a refer receiver writes the data to a buffer for temporary storage, and the there is a sync or an exporter which takes the data from the buffer and exports it to the telemetry backend. Uh, so, it typically, like this is the simplest form of a telemetry pipeline. The next slide, please. So, uh, as uh, George just asked, hey, like, where do you do data transformation and all those operations? Uh, a slightly more complex pipeline is the answer to that. So, the receiver takes the telemetry data, writes it to a buffer, typically like something like Kafka, KineSS, or Rab uh, RabbitMQ. Uh, and then there is a process, like a preprocessor, that actually does the transformation and typically it writes it back to the buffer. And then we have an exporter that takes the data from the buffer and exports it to a telemetry backend. So uh, next slide, please. And uh, let's, so, so far we have talked about it in the abstract. Let's actually uh, talk about it a little bit using a use case of the Slack tracing pipeline. So we have a lot of applications here in uh, Hack, uh, which is our preferred languages for our backend. Uh, so, we have applications in Hack, we have desktop and mobile applications. Uh, the desktop applications are in JavaScript, the mobile applications are in iOS and Java respectively. And all of these applications are constantly producing telemetry. Uh, this telemetry data generally is in the format of an internal uh, format called a span event format. It's a public format. It's a uh, little bit about span event format is, uh, before open telemetry existed, we wanted to represent spans as a generic format and we came up with the span event format. And the span event format is a much more simplified version of an open telemetry span. So we report all our telemetry data as a span event to a Wallace, uh, which is a receiver which accepts all the data, both from internal applications as well as applications on the internet. Uh, and uh, it, Wallace writes the data to Kafka. Uh, similarly, we also have our Java and Jaeger applications, which produce the data in uh, either Zipkin span format or Jaeger span format. We have a data transformer, which accepts this data and writes that data to Wallace. Uh, and the Wallace in turn writes this data to Kafka. 
And we have several muron consumers uh, which consume this data. One of those consumers takes the data and sends it to a real-time store like Honeycomb. And then we have another muron consumer that takes this data and puts it in our data warehouse. And depending on their use case uh, and whether they need a real-time data or whether they need to run batch analytics, our users would pick either Honeycomb or Elasticsearch or our data warehouse to consume this data. Um, and uh, yeah. I have a question. Uh, do you have a rough idea of the ratio between payload of tracing, logging, and metrics data? Yes, uh, our trace data uh, is about, uh, so our log data is about a petabyte a week. Uh, our metrics data is about, uh, a, we manage about uh, a tens of billions of time series over a month. Uh, and uh, we ingest about 10 million to somewhere between 10 and 20 million metrics per second. And uh, our trace data is about, uh, about, a few, about a few hundred terabytes, about 100 terabytes or so per, per, uh, yeah, per week. And uh, uh, yes, uh, yes, the telemetry data for tracing is actually pretty verbose compared to logs. And this is actually one of the reasons why we invented the span event format where we write both our logs and traces in the same format. That way you don't, you're kind of not duplicating the same data twice. So if uh, that is another thing you can look at if volume is a concern for you for tracing and logging. Um, I love that example because one of the things that we harp on is the fact that traces are just interconnected logs, right? And like that yeah. is that yeah. same concept in practice, right? Yeah. The only thing that we're is a couple of IDs. So exactly logs and steroids. That is amazing. I love that. Uh, yeah. And uh, moving on uh, a little bit about uh, challenges maintaining telemetry pipelines. As you've seen, uh, we actually move uh, a ton of data through our telemetry pipeline. And uh, moving this, uh, so as a result, managing this pipeline comes at a cost. We manage hundreds to thousands of servers uh, that run this pipeline, but our pipeline is uh, stateless. So uh, it's relatively painless to manage it, but, uh, but there are challenges managing a complex pipeline as this one. The first one is performance. Um, so we have to constantly tune this pipeline for performance, uh, for performance of uh, uh, how much resources are being consumed. Uh, if we are not keeping it performance, the costs can balloon quite quickly. So what we actually do is we tell our, uh, we try to keep the amount of processing in the pipeline to a minimum. Uh, as much as possible. Uh, the second thing, uh, challenge with managing a telemetry pipeline is managing the availability because it's a real-time system and our users expect to see their data in real time. Uh, you have to plan ahead for how uh, this, the availability of the system, uh, how you do operations, et cetera. So the system actually stays up. Uh, and uh, the third problem, in uh, managing a telemetry pipeline is correctness because we actually allow our users to add rules for data transformation or filtering and things like that. Uh, tracking whether the pipeline is actually working as expected is, uh, could be a challenge in practice and uh, making sure that the pipeline is correct at all times and not doing things uh, like drop it, either dropping data or uh, or uh, manipulating, corrupting the data is also very important. Uh, one of the things in the telemetry pipeline to kind of like think about even when you're using refinery is uh, sampling is a doublet sport because uh, if you sample the data away, uh, you don't know whether that event did not happen or whether that event happened, but you threw it away. So this is where uh, correctness is even more important. So uh, yeah, that's the other, uh, the kind of disadvantage of sampling is uh, you don't know if the event didn't happen or you threw it away. 
uh, which is kind of important. Uh, and the final part, as I talked about, is once you are managing a healthy pipeline, uh, data freshness is of utmost importance. So we need to keep a constant eye to make sure our data is fresh and our pipeline is not lagging. Uh, and when we do lag, sometimes we actually have to make the tough decision between backfilling the data or scaling up the cluster to catch up or uh, temporarily dropping the data to get back uh, to having fresh data in our pipeline. So these are some of the challenges. There are more. Can I ask you, like in in terms of uh, in terms of managing your telemetry pipeline, especially given that performance is uh, such a key concern, along with availability, how what what where does the telemetry for your pipeline go? Like, how is how is that process <laughs> managed? So uh, that is also, again, like we use observability tools to manage those pipelines as well. So uh, it kind of is kind of like a meta thing. <laughs> but yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, it generally works out very well because uh, even though it's we call it a pipeline, it's like tens of processes uh, running several clusters. And we also are very mindful of how we monitor them. For example, we don't monitor them on the same cluster that we monitor the rest of the applications. And we are also mindful when we are upgrading those clusters, we don't do two changes at the same time. Like we don't change the telemetry pipeline and like the monitoring pipeline, or let, let's say upgrading our backends at the same time. Uh, we just do one change at a time. We, it's, it's a challenge, but it's like, it's not that hard. Okay. And there's a, there's a question in the chat from Peter. How responsive do you need scaling to be? Uh, I would repeat that one. Um, so scaling cannot be that responsive because it could take about two or three minutes for your injector to scale up. That we tend to run at a bit scale with the above, probably about 50% overhead because typically if the slash difference has problems, we would get a lot of events in the base to appear your time and that are not um not today um not good for scary more work with scary so, um the end is trying to keep a bit uh, number of to do with the button yeah the other and thing that i think yeah. is relevant here right is that similar to us you also run kind of these large kafka clusters right so therefore there is some room to buffer the data in kafka and then catch up later right mm -hmm. yeah exactly yeah Uh, can we go to the next slide? Yeah, in conclusion, uh, telemetry pipelines are hard, like they are uh, a category of their own in general. And uh, if you are building your own, we, we have our own in-house software and it works uh, and we cobbled together something with in-house software plus open source components because that was the best solution when we started. Like almost like five, six years ago. And uh, these days though, uh, there are a lot of open source tools which actually uh, do very similar things. So we recommend that you use open source tools if you are building your own telemetry pipeline. And uh, I think at, at once you hit uh, a certain scale in observability, uh, having a strong telemetry pipeline is what basically gives you real-time view into your business. So this is something I think you want to focus on and think through, especially once you hit a certain scale and are trying to scale up your systems. For that, uh, I am having a really hard time with slides today, like I mentioned before. So uh, I just want to let folks on the webinar know that um, there is an event survey for uh, today's webinar. So uh, again, uh, I want to remind you, if you have questions, please drop them in the chat. And I see a couple of questions coming in already. Um, but in the meantime, I want to let you know that Honeycomb values your feedback. And uh, as a result, if you complete a survey about this webinar before 12 PM Pacific tomorrow, we'll send you a t-shirt to say thanks. Bethany just dropped a link into the chat, or you can scan the QR code uh, that's on your screen. Uh, the uh, uh, the forms have a password for them. Uh, so when you fill it out, the password for this one is event eight. So that's event space number eight. Um, and uh, uh, fill those out. Let us know what you think of today's webinar. And again, we'll send you a t-shirt. So uh, with that, we will go on to uh, some of the questions. So let's see. Uh, the first one that I see here 
is uh, Mason asks, what scale is the Kafka cluster being ran at? Uh, and is, uh, is it something like cruise control being used to manage uh, rebalances? Yeah, so uh, we run about uh, a trillion messages through Kafka every day, uh, maybe a little bit more now. Uh, and uh, yes, we do manage uh, our uh, clusters using cruise control. Uh, and uh, we also have a blog post on our blog, Slack engineering blog uh, that I wrote on how we manage our Kafka clusters. You're free to uh, read it. Yeah, I mean, Frank shared the link, so. Yeah, Frank just shared a link to that blog uh, in the Slack. Thank you, uh, thank you, Suman. Thanks, uh, hey, listen, I had a question. When when it comes to uh, recommendations on getting started and you, rec you recommended getting started with open source tools, um, Drilling into that, like what's what's a practical way to get started? Because some of the functionality that you describe mm -hmm. um, can be done with an open telemetry collector. So can we talk yeah. about like maybe hotel collectors and how they compare and, and using them as a way to get started with uh, telemetry sure. pipelines? Sure. Uh, I haven't kept up with the open telemetry collectors much, but my understanding of open telemetry collectors is they primarily work with uh, open telemetry events. Uh, but if uh, you're a Prometheus shop or something like that, or if you have uh, uh, Elasticsearch somewhere in the mix, or if you have events, which observability tools, like none of the open telemetry tools actually uh, support, then you might want to go outside the open telemetry uh, bubble and explore those, for example. Uh, like some of the tools like um, uh, Cribo, uh, or uh, the other one is uh, Datadog has one uh, called uh, it's in Rust. Um, I forget its name. Uh, the, the Fluent bit is one more. Uh, and all of these are actually tools that you could use to cobble together. And also I'm not, I think Open Telemetry Collected is also mostly designed for source and sync. I don't think it has any processing components in it. Like you can't transform things in the open telemetry collector too. So there are like a few limitations like that. See, um, let me see if I missed a question. <laughs> yeah, there's um, data system history behind that it should um, we did have actually did um, I three to run Kafka, and then we found that every time we tried to uh, kick up a replication, the the uh, actually did were not actually fast enough, and the uh, the D threes have twelve speedy disks. So combined, that actually more I bandwidth than the I threes, and it's something that we still try to repeat every day, and. Uh, yeah, it doesn't really make sense, but that's what we do. I would be very curious to have a chat with you after after this, because yeah, um, have you heard the good word about the IM4 series, <laughs> etc. But we can talk about that later. Um, cool. Um, I think one question I had is I talked earlier. I kind of foreshadowed, you know, Refinery and um, and and Moran working together, kind of. You set that up recently, kind of how did it go? How was it to transition that over? Kind of how did you keep that running smoothly so that it would uh, and verify that it was working correctly? Yeah, so we had uh, uh, refinery. So we set up refinery like a few, uh, like last year, and we've been running it for a few months now in production. And uh, we primarily use it right now where previously Muron consumer used to directly write, send a uh, it traces to honeycomb and uh, but we wanted tail sampling uh, so the i think refinery is probably the only tool out there that actually does tail tail sampling at scale uh, so we did set that up on our bedrock and uh, i think so far it's been easy to scale it up scale it down uh, one of the things that was interesting uh, was uh, setting up the discovery mechanism was interesting uh, setting up the discovery mechanism where uh, between all the nodes, uh, we have our own in-house thing called Nebula. Setting that uh, up to work with Nebula was like an interesting challenge. Uh, but other than that, so far it's working uh, well and uh, uh, it scales well to our scale. Uh, the 
the, we actually recently ran into an issue that was a little bit uh, tricky, uh, but it probably could be like on our end or refinery, uh, but uh, it's pretty good uh, so far. And you just had to change the endpoint, right? Because refinery yeah. takes in the same open telemetry protocol or honeycomb uh, event protocol. Yes, we just had to change the endpoint and then just run that through refinery and everything is fine now. All right, excellent. I want to let folks know uh, if you're watching this webinar recording, uh, uh, please download the chat log as well. I think there have been some really great uh, little bits of additional context that have been added uh, throughout the discussion. So uh, be sure to tune into those as you are um, watching the notes from uh, today's event. Um, with that, uh, I want to let you know that we have a couple of additional uh, uh, events to, to keep an eye out for. Um, we, again, will send you a link for this uh, recording uh, so that you can watch it on demand, uh, and that should be in your inbox soon. So please feel free to share that link uh, for today's content uh, if, uh, if you enjoyed what we were presenting. Uh, so with that, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, have a happy week, everyone, and we'll see you uh, at the next event in the series. Have a good day.